We are at an extraordinary moment for space exploration. In 2022, for the first time ever, astronomers were able to capture an image of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope identified the most distant star ever observed, and the launch of the James Webb Telescope delivered the sharpest image of the distant universe to date. But despite these groundbreaking advancements, science is facing a crisis of legitimacy. Public distrust in science is on the rise as scientific misinformation continues to flourish online. So how do we win the battle for evidence-based truth? In an Upfront special, I'll ask renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Delighted to be with you. Thanks for having me. There's a poll that says that over a quarter of Americans don't believe that climate change is caused by human activity. And 6% don't believe it's happening at all, right? There's another one that says that over a quarter of Americans are skeptical of vaccines. Now, you actually just produced a documentary on misinformation, so I gotta ask you, when did science and scientific facts become something that's up for public debate? Yeah, so I, I hate to just sound so obvious about this, but part of it is a failure of the educational system, which teaches science as a sort of a satchel of facts that you sort of pour into the empty vessel that you are as you sit there in the classroom. And, and, and you're given this fat book and there are these words that are boldface and you gotta remember, remember those words for the exam and then you move on. And at no time really, I think not even in the lab sections of the classes, do you really deeply learn what science is and how and why it works? And so if somebody comes out with a research result that's intriguing or controversial, the press typically rushes towards it, but it's not really an authentic result until it's verified by other researchers because there could be bias manifested within it. Maybe the wall current fluctuated when they got their result. Anything could have happened. So a fundamental feature of science is that whatever result you get, I'm going to try to verify it or falsify it. All right. In fact, I might be a competitor of yours. and I don't trust anything the guy does. I'm going to do it myself. Oh, hey, I got the same result. And someone in another country does it. Somebody with a different mind. And then once you get agreement of these research results, then you have an objective truth. But if you only sample science on that bleeding frontier, that messy frontier, you would think we didn't know what the hell we were doing at any time. When it's a feature of science that we have these, that frontier information is contested. Your, your book, Starry Messenger, uh, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization, you say that certain beliefs about science become true in people's minds when they're constantly repeated in the media, and you call this a fundamental feature of propaganda. Um, talk to me a little bit about this propaganda. Where do these beliefs come from, and what's the primary source of the propaganda, as you put it, and who's the most culpable outside of the media itself? Thank you. That's a great question. You know, I tried to think, what does truth mean? And I don't want to usurp the word and give it only one definition because then you just get into fights. So I want to give people how they use the word. So I split the, the kingdom of truths into three categories. So one of them is objective truths. These are, the, these are things that are true whether or not you believe in them. And the methods and tools of science are exquisitely tuned to establish objective truths in this world. Then there's personal truths. These are truths that are true to you, but you, they may not be true to someone else. Is Jesus your savior? Is Muhammad your last prophet on earth? These are your personal truths. And in a free country, no one can take those away from you. A third kind of truth, I, I call it a political truth, is just something that becomes true in your head simply because it's repeated so often. And we have this system, we evolved, to say to ourselves, well, if we hear something often, it must be true. Otherwise, why would it happen that often? And so the brain rewires and it says, yep, that's the truth. And this is the soul of propaganda. So, so what's our response to that? I'm thinking specifically, for example, during the pandemic, when you had people spreading all kinds of misinformation online, not just people uh, who said, this isn't so bad, right? 
uh, but people who were actually promoting ivermectin, uh, hydrochloroquine as actual miracle cures for COVID. I mean, that's dangerous stuff. All of this stuff is happening in a, in a sphere, uh, online, the political sphere, sometimes in a White House press room even. When this stuff is happening, what should be our response? Should we be regulating speech online? I'm not talking about uh, just saying people don't have a right to express their opinions, okay. but, okay. but so, what about this other stuff? There's a whole chapter in the book called Risk and Reward. And I make the point, which I'm gonna make here, that our brains, the human brain, is not natively wired to think statistically or probabilistically about anything, okay? And some people know this and fully exploit this fact, and so they've created what we call casinos to completely exploit our inability to understand probability and statistics. They exploit this fact and they take your money and you go home without it, okay? Uh, typically, that's what happens. And so because we don't think statistically about it, we think anecdotally about it, and this infuses in all decisions we make in our lives. And what we say, well, I don't trust the CDC, but I'm gonna trust my Aunt Matilda, or I'm gonna trust this guy on the internet. And you know what sells on a YouTube? Just watch it, okay, you ready? It's, at the establishment thinks this, but what I have is actually true, and they don't want you to know it. Uh, oh my gosh, if you lead off your YouTube video that way, millions of views guaranteed. There's something about doing something that is not the establishment that is irresistibly attractive to us. And I don't fully, I'm not a psychologist, uh, I, I don't fully understand it, but it's pernicious in our environment, and it could be the seeds of the unraveling of an informed democracy. There's another piece to this, though, because I agree with you. There are people who say, look, you can't trust the state. You can't trust the government. You can't trust the establishment because I have this great story, this great anecdote that appeals more to your desires. True. But then there are legitimate reasons not to trust the establishment. I'm thinking, for example, about the history of medical abuse and medical racism in the United States. I'm thinking about uh, the Tuskegee study. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about... Uh, a low point in, in the medical and the annals of medical treatment. Yes. Absolutely. And for my audience's sake, of course, that's a study that started in the, in the 1930s when black men were left to die untreated of syphilis. Uh, we have indigenous people who were used as subjects for tuberculosis vaccine trials also in the 30s. And in the 70s, thousands of indigenous women were also forcibly sterilized. So against the backdrop of that, for example, there's legitimate reasons why certain communities, certain people, or maybe all of us say, look, I can't trust the establishment. That's why I'm vaccine hesitant. How do we... Right, so there are ways to do that. So you say, uh, especially in the black community, um, what you, if you're worried that the vaccines will, you know, uh, what, if you're worried about their, whether they'll harm you and there's some racist motive for it because of this, these cases in the past, what you do is step in the vaccine line between two white people. <laughs> <laughs> there are trivial solutions to this. Okay. Now, I don't mean to make light of these re very real problems that, that uh, institutionalize racism, sexism, and uh, practically every other ism has manifested. Yes, okay? You have to ask yourself, is that reason to never trust anything they ever do since? And if so, this is this is sort of cancellation principles that have been uh, rampant in, especially in social media. So, uh, if if an institution does one thing wrong, then you, you don't trust anything they do. Yeah, well, but it, but it's not it's not one thing. It's it, it's it's there's a fundamental belief that the state, as such, almost by definition, is untrustworthy. That's a different position than oh, you messed up once. This is about saying that the medical establishment, the scientific establishment, the politicization of medicine is untrustworthy. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yes. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, that's yes. Hard. So line them up. So you line them up. And you say, that's bad. And they, we were deceived. Yes. Now, next to that, make a list of achievements earned by the state. Okay? Look at the distribution of the polio vaccine and how many lives were stay, stayed. Look at the statistics of that. Look at the increased longevity of the human species everywhere in the world brought about by advances in medical technologies and, and the science associated with it. Put that alongside. Do you realize 150 years ago, the life expectancy of humans on Earth was only slightly higher 
than when we were living in caves wow. 30,000 years ago. So put it next to it. What else has the, quote, state done? The state runs NASA, okay? And puts stuff on the moon and on Mars and on asteroids. Fair, fair enough. You, 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 talk, you, you talked about NASA. I, I, I want to think about NASA a little bit because last year was a huge... You got a picture of NASA right there on your wall right there. The, 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 the James Webb telescope yes. on the side of your set. Um, last year... <laughs> Last year was a, a significant year for, for space discoveries. Uh, for the first time, astronomers captured an image of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Also, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope identified the most distant star ever observed. And of course, uh, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope delivered a deep field image of the, quote, invisible universe, showing us unseen parts of the cosmos. It's, it's quite fascinating stuff. And uh, the most distant galaxies we've, we've ever observed are now accessible to us in a certain kind of way. Uh, can you talk to me about 2022? Um, out of everything that happened, what was the biggest discovery in your estimation, and how does it influence our understanding of space, and maybe even science, uh, in the years to come? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm delighted to report that investments in this country and others, our partners in science, continues and continues to push the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that image of a black hole, we always knew it was there, but to get evidence of what it's doing to the distorted fabric of space and time around it, that was justifiably banner headlines. And the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope, oh my gosh, I mean, that so much could have gone wrong. And you know who doesn't get enough credit in this? Are the engineers that mm. figured out how to build this thing. How do you make an eight meter telescope fit into the fairing of a rocket? Well, you fold it. You know, astrophysicists didn't figure that out, engineers did. You fold it and then unfurl it when you get to your destination, all right? They figured that out, and so I, I tip my hat, with my hat, tip <laughs> my hat uh, to the engineers that enable our discoveries in astrophysics. So, so yeah, people who are into science, you could also be into engineering and still participate on that frontier of research. So it was all good on the year. You said something interesting in an interview with Stephen Colbert talking about the Webb Telescope, uh, and you said that as our area of knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. I thought that was beautifully put. You should be a poet in addition to a scientist. Um, okay. how, how ignorant are we of the vastness of the universe? That's a great question. And by the way, I wrote an essay some years ago called The Perimeter of Ignorance. The point is, as you learn what is going on in the universe, then you, your area of knowledge grows. So that this is, a, this is a, a highly potent analogy, I think. The area grows, but wait a minute, the perimeter of that area is also growing. So, oh. the, so, so for example, I know to ask questions today because I'm standing in a new place brought to you by the James Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble, if you wanna go back a couple of decades, I can ask a question today that I didn't even think to ask 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and in some cases, five years ago. So your curiosity fed by the, 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 intent, the intention to advance this moving frontier puts you in a new vista you can see where you've never seen before. So now you're going to say, well, how vast is that field of ignorance? We don't know. But I tell you what we do know. There are two drivers in the universe. We, we have terms for them, but we don't know what they are. But we call them dark matter and dark energy. These are some of the longest unsolved problems in astrophysics. If you add up their effect on the universe, it is 96% of what's going on. Hmm. And we do not know or understand what they are or what causes them. Everything you know and love about, the, we all know and love about this universe, the chemistry, the biology, the physics, the aerodynamics, the, 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 the orbital dynamics, everything we understand is contained in 4% of what's driving the universe. So we're in a odd situation where we know enough about the universe to quantify what we don't know. And that's exciting to the scientist. It's not terrifying, it's exciting. That is exciting to the scientist. It's exciting to the everyday nerd. It's exciting to lots of us, right? Um, 
Then there's a part of me, though, that says, yes, as much as I'd like to know more, as much as I'd like to use your quote to make the entire solar system like our a backyard, that sounds great. But that investment, both of time, of intellectual resources, and of money, to some, is, is what should be devoted to our problems here on the ground on this planet, that there's systemic issues, institutional issues, structural issues that we have to deal with, and, it's, and that it's a zero-sum game, that when we spend too much time out there, we're not dealing with what's going on down here. What do you say to that argument? Well, you can ask, how much do you think we're spending in space? The space station, the James Webb, the Hubble, the mission to the moon, the Artemis missions. What fraction of your tax dollar, if you're an American, do you think we're spending? And when I ask that to people, they say, oh, no, 10%, maybe 15%. We're spending four-tenths of a penny of your tax dollar doing all those activities. So you can take a, a greenback, take a dollar bill, and cut four-tenths of 1% off of the edge, and it doesn't even get you into the ink. So you're saying, why are we spending it there when we should be solving these problems here? We're spending 99.6% of a budget down here. And you want to grab it from this 0.4% and say, that's going to solve the problem? Really? Take a look at the budgets. Take a look at how and where and why we're spending money. To a person, none of them have actually looked at how that 99.6% of the budget is invested. And I think if you did, you might be saying, well, we're spending too much over here. Or over here, there are 29 dozen places you could point to. Hmm. Meanwhile, when NASA makes a discovery, it is headlines. You know why? Because people care. They want to look up. They want some kind of hope for what science and technology can be and do for their future. And, and, and it, it, it's transformative. It's space technology that gave you GPS that you take for granted that's sitting on your smartphone. And that's how you can find the short, the quickest way to grandma in the to grandma's house in traffic. Yeah. Without thinking, what well, these are satellites or sent to Middle Earth orbit. Okay, Middle Earth, not Middle Earth. <laughs> I know too Lord of the Rings, right. but <laughs> so 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 it's space. That, how do you know the hurricane is coming, and what path it's going to take? Satellite technology brought that to you. No, we're spending money in space, and we shouldn't spend it down here. So. I can't, here's what I'm gonna do. We'll sneak into your house in the dark of night and remove everything in your home that was inspired or enabled by investments in space technology. And you'll, by the, when you wake up in the morning, it might be indistinguishable from a cave because that's kind of where we'd be without what those investments have delivered to modern civilization. Now, those investments have also delivered some other stuff. Um, in 2001, you, you proposed creating a space force, which eventually came into existence in 2019 uh, under President Donald Trump. Uh, the U.S. Space Force is now defined as, uh, quote, a military service that organizes, trains, and equips space forces in order to protect U.S. and allied interests in space. You've examined the relationship between astrophysics and the military uh, in Accessory to War, your book, Accessory to War. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, at the same time that we think about these extraordinary advances and technological benefits, do you worry about potential qu consequences of militarizing space? So a couple of points. Uh, in 2001, I was in a White House commission where that was discussed. Yes. Uh, but we were not the only commission where that was discussed. Um, so the, the Space Force has been percolating for decades. And uh, so uh, Donald Trump decided to act on it. So Trump haters would, would associate it with Trump, but really it's been in discussion long, it long predates Donald Trump, just to be clear about that. Second, um, no, nobody wants war. Nobody wants, no, nobody wants that, all right? So, so I wanna first say that the Space Force wasn't created out of, you know, out of the ether. It kind of already existed. How? In what was called the US Space Command, which was a branch of the US Air Force. It already existed. They're the ones who launched the GPS. So when you create a space force, what primarily occurred was that this branch of the Air Force was separated out and given its own budget line. But, but it feels like we're expanding the, the, the theater of war. I mean, I, I hear Donald Trump saying, uh, he, he once said that the, the space force was created because, quote, space is the world's newest war fighting domain and amid grave threats to our national security american superiority in space 
is absolutely vital. I, I agree. I know you don't want war. And I know most sane, normal people don't want war. But, the, but, but there's a lot of money in war, a lot of investment in war. So, so now we're in modern times. And ask yourself, um, how much space assets do we have? And how much of our economy depends on it? You know, what is Uber valued at in billions? Uber does not exist without space assets. Neither does DirecTV. Neither does the Weather Channel. Neither does uh, 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 the app Tinder, okay? <laughs> Just to take an absurd limiting example of the financial value of our space assets. So you say to yourself, what should the military be doing as in their goal? Well, I'd want them to protect our assets. I, I, is that, I, I think that's a natural need of a sovereign nation to have any military that they fund to protect their assets. And our assets in space today are huge. Yeah, I, I, huge. And it goes I, way I gotta, beyond NASA. I, I, way be NASA's a tiny I, I, little I piece. I got you. You know, I, I appreciate that. I, I think, though, the idea that this sort of posture and these investments are purely to protect assets rather than to expand power and maybe empire, that's where the tension comes in, right? It's like we're not just protecting our stuff. We're getting other stuff. And, and, and that... Well, that's a... That's a... That's a... That's a a caricature of our presence in space, okay? So the military is going to protect our assets, make sure we can conduct business, make sure we can do the things we normally do based on all of the things we have put into space. Now, if, if there is someone else that's perceived as a threat, then we can think of military actions rather than just uh, defensive actions, so offensive actions, or or uh, let, me, uh, let me not say offensive, let me say, um, if there's a satellite that we believe is putting us at risk, then I wouldn't put it past the Space Force to take out that satellite in, by some way. And there are a lot of ways to do that. But this whole thing with Star Wars, with, with ships fighting each other, no, that is not what's going on. Okay. That's not what's happening here. That's not how space works. You said something in st your book, Starry Messenger, that st sticks with me. You said cosmic perspectives can force us to take pause and reflect on the meaning of life and on the value of peace that sustains it. That, that really resonates with me. What does it mean? What is the significance for all of us regular folk to have a cosmic perspective? Yeah, so what happens is it takes you out of yourself and out of your own ego, and it forces you to look, uh, I really don't like this word, but I'm gonna use it here, holistically mm -hmm. at life on Earth, not just humans on Earth, but life on Earth, and the ecosystem that sustains us. And it's not just a stratospheric view, it's, a, it's higher than that. And with your permission, I, I wanna quote Apollo 14 astronaut, Edgar Mitchell. You develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, International politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a Ooh, that, that is, that is a cosmic perspective. I, 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 I'm telling you that, I'm telling you that is the cosmic perspective to end all cosmic perspectives. So I have, the, have these fantasies where Elon creates a space bus and with his Airbus, the company, the space bus, get all the warring leaders, put them on the bus, set them to the moon, and have them look back at Earth. And you say, do you see the border between your country and the one you're fighting? No. Uh, do you see the people dying? No. Do you see the, the havoc you're wreaking? No. That's just Earth. And we're all in it together. And it's all we have. And there's no hope. That, there's no hint that, 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 that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Hmm. It's up to us to do something about it. Carl Sagan wrote about this in the Pale Blue Dot decades ago. So yeah, it can transform the world. And yes, bring about everlasting peace. Hate to sound like a beauty pageant contestant, but yes, world peace is <laughs> possible when you look at Earth from above. I love it, I love it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thanks for having me. All right, that is our show, Upfront. We'll be back.